are presenting to our product associations. Agenda, uh, company logo, number of pages, etc. But actually, a lot of stuff that were more easy to Let's start with some small talk history. Uh, well, in, in 1980, small talk was a research project at PAP. And some people say it was jailed inside their research laboratory and it's not in heaven. It's what I've said, well, I want to get out. I want to get out to the public. So what happened in August 1981, this was 30 years ago, we finally got free on the small talk balloon. Um, only problem is, in my opinion, what happened in the 30 years since then? Well, it's still inside the balloon. And... Um, we still have the balloon, we haven't gone much further. I mean, we've developed small talk, but we're still in our small talk community. Maybe except one, maybe except 2005, we had a rocket. Uh, but we're still in the balloon. What happened with the rest of the world? Well, they evolved. They are playing together today. And they're having fun. And we are alone in our balloon. Well, actually, I was a little bit pessimistic when I made the presentation. And when I heard some of the other talks, it's not that bad, actually. People are playing with you, people, people are playing with Java, people are interacting with other stuff. But it just recently we started to, to interact with the other people. And um, so, what was my motivation doing this? Well, obviously, it was to go play with the other guys. Um, so, so, I'll talk a little bit about my background and motivation. I've been doing small talk since 1998. Uh, my background is business applications. I'm not coming from the university background, it's business applications. I'm not a coffee drinker. I prefer the lines of that, of the shiny stars, and you know, the stuff there. Um, this way my knowledge is. And so, one of the reasons I decided to do this is to improve my knowledge of the platform. This is where I can make money. Uh, this is where I was also consulting one of my businesses. So, uh, obviously, the next question was. Why would I do this? And what was the output of the product? Should it cost money or should it be free? <coughs> well, some people say, hey, you can make money out of this, etc. But I don't believe this. I believe that a small talk today or any other part of the language is it's a commodity, something that you get for free. I mean, how many people have paid for Java or .NET? It comes for free. A lot of other languages are free. I think the it, language itself is a commodity. Anyway, in 2011. No other people disagree with me, but that's my opinion. Uh, I believe uh, the other that you can charge for the tools, the enterprise tools that are used to develop the application. Um, so let's go back to what are the goals of this small talk. It's to implement X3J20 compliance small talk. X3J20 is the ANSI standard for small talk. It's quite thin, but it's well documented. Uh, the other goal is to be a first class member of the DLR family, meaning that we should be an equal citizen of uh, the DLR world, the uh, DLR universe, which means that we should be able to play in the other languages. This is the next point that uh, we should easily interlock with the rest of .NET because there is a lot of stuff in .NET. The same way as Java has a lot of libraries and interesting stuff. So that's .NET. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. We just say, I want this, and there you get it. And of course, this is performance. Not the fastest, but this is. Um, so, and uh, yeah, and it's a personal challenge <laughs> for me, so that's the reason to develop it. Um, so let's go and look at some more technical details. Um, I don't have to explain what the Microsoft.net is, people obviously know this, but there's a thing called the Dynamic Language Runtime. And this is a component developed recently on top of the .NET to allow dynamic languages to run easier on their virtual machine. Uh, and what it is, it is a playground. It's a playground where the languages can play and, and they provide the toys. So you can actually play together with that. And, um, and the TLR facilitates this communication between the, between the languages uh, to interact with each other. Uh, but we'll talk more about those components, what they are, and what, how they help us, etc. But I'll go back from my presentation to the very, very basic of small talk. You know, the very most important thing of small talk, message sent. Because this is what makes small talk specific. 
Well, this one taken to revolutionary back then. It wasn't function calls, it was message sets. And obviously, what is a message set? Well, it's the ability to communicate with each other. And in the case of computers, obviously, this is so one object can call and the other object, but at, at the end, it's a communication between parts of the computer program, between objects. So let's go to something very, very simple, something people could plus you can see. Hello world. And uh, most of my agenda will be around this hello world. What does it mean and how do we implement this on top of the dot .NET? Um, so the first thing is, what is the main thing in this hello world example? Well, obviously we have some string, which is a custom, doesn't matter. We have the transcript, which is an object. But the interesting thing is the show. Show is um, what's the interesting part of the hello world example. This is the, the, the key part of the message set, the selector. Um, and what's interesting, how is this implemented? How do we implement the message set uh, for this hello world example? Uh, so obviously a lot of you know small how you'll say yeah yeah the transcript implements the method show. Uh, and of course it does this. Somebody has to implement the method. And what the method show, this is by the way taken from squeak. The squeak implementation says self next to all now to string and so um, it's important for us to know that this method implementation has the logic that's necessary to perform the message. Um, and the other thing is, when the message is being sent to the object, show something, how does it know exactly what to do? Well, the thing is very obvious. It needs to do a method lookup and find where the logic for the show is. And uh, yeah, transcript show and we go and figure out the transcript. The transcript stream that and three has a method called show. And this method contains the logic. And this is the important part because the method lookup is probably the key thing, the key part of sending messages. Uh, and this is what we need to implement to be able to communicate with other objects. Uh, so let's go back and look at the, this example, the hello world example, a little bit more primitive to simplify it. Um, and what I've chosen here is slightly other sometimes, but it does the same. This has a message, it finds a message with the receiver, the selector, some parameters, and evaluates the message. The results hopefully should be the same. Uh, but it has this advantage that in here we have a finite number of uh, <coughs> methods that are needed to evaluate this. The only thing that's different is that the method name is now a variable and not uh, and not hard coded somehow into the source code. It is some magic. And another thing is that we have an object for the message set itself. And um, the terminology people use for this is not a message, it's a call site. Because this is the site where the call happens. This is the .NET terminology. This is the place where the message uh, is being sent. Um, so um, let's look a little bit uh, more at the call side and see how we can refactor this in a way that's more um, attractive to us. Um, and one way to say is we have a call side which has a selector because we want to do a show. And we do an evaluation here where we give it the parameters. Actually, the receiver itself is a parameter. So we want to evaluate it with the receiver and with the arguments. <coughs> and why are we doing this? Because we want to generalize some of this uh, uh, stuff. And to generalize a little bit more, let's say we don't have a call site, but we have a call site on an object called binder. And this binder object is a helper object. Uh, need to find the show method later. So the call sign now will be a generic thing, and the binder object is needed um, to perform the message set, which means to resolve the selector to some uh, complete implementation. But the rest is still the same, by the way. Um, so the binder object will have, uh, by the way, this is done in .NET, I've just uh, written the same logic in small box so it's a small conference. 
So the binder object gets a method called bind for an argument. So uh, when the message, when somebody says a binder from the message, the method, the not the call side, the call side will say, okay, I need help. I go to the binder and say, I need, I need you to help me bind the shop operation. I need to tell us, this is the receiver, those are the arguments. So the binder object, this is a naive implementation, by the way, but it will say, okay, a receiver compile by text show. Remember, this is show what we wanted to do. And it will return the logic for, for, uh, for, for this message. Um, and the binder knows it must return the logic for the show method, because this is, there is a binder of every single message set. Um, so it returns the show. And obviously, we live in 2011. We want a dynamic world. You know, we want to reflect the objects. A lot of stuff. The talks are here. How can we make things dynamic? How can we make it? Uh, yeah, well, how can we make things dynamic? How can we ha have the objects uh, to become more clever? How can they be reflective? And obviously, the, the, the most logical thing is to go back to the example. Is instead of uh, having the binder figure out how to do the, the, the show, uh, how, what is the logic for the show method, it should be called that right way. Let's ask the object itself. So the binder will go to the object and say, okay, somebody wants to do to perform the message show. What's the logic for this message? And the object itself will say something like, um, and this is again the implementation, say, okay, yeah, I want to do the I don't know what to do, but the pattern can tell us the selector, so in this, in this case with the show. So the object will say, the compile method add, selector and return the compile method for the show message. Or alternatively, this is where the dynamic part comes. Instead of returning just a static method, it can dynamically generate whatever method it wants. And this is the magic, because it's inter instance specific. It doesn't have to be bound for a class. The object can return whatever logic it wants for this operation. Uh, alternatively, in most cases, in most cases, is the object says, actually, I don't care about any specific logic. I'm happy enough with the standard implementation of show. So it will actually fall back to the binder and say, I don't have anything special. Do the standard logic. So the binder has a method called fallback. The binder will say, okay, the standard implementation of the show is to get the go to the class and ask for the compound method implementation. And this is the, the, the tricky part because you have two, uh, two levels. First, first, we ask the object for the object for the specific message. And then you go for back to the binder, which is like a classic idea. Uh, and that's why you can get this specific logic. Uh, an object can, an object instance can return some uh, whatever logic it wants. Um, and this division allows us to interrupt with other languages because if, if the object we are talking with is not a small object, but a Ruby object or the head object, we don't know what their class is. We don't know how what logic for their method is. And that's why we have to ask a Ruby object. How do we do this operation? And the Ruby also will come back and say, oh, listen, listen uh, you want to show something, you know, it's the logic for it. And same is true for other languages. And it works the same way, same thing the other way around. If, if somebody is doing a Ruby call and they want to say, uh, well, next put all to a Smalltalk string, the Ruby binder will come and go and ask the Smalltalk object and say, yeah, somebody is asking for it. Next of all, on you, what should I do? And the smart object can return the logic necessary to perform this operation. Or the smart object can say, I don't want to do it, go back to the Ruby object. And the Ruby object can actually uh, to the Ruby binder. And the Ruby binder can decide, okay, I have implementation for this anyway. Um, I'll come back with more examples about this, but uh, this is the good thing. The only problem is, that you can't return a compound method because compound method is a small thing. So, .NET has 
I think of expression trees. And expression trees is not exactly byte code because byte code is linear. It's like a super abstract semantic tree uh, telling you how to execute certain logic. And uh, I'm just going for some of the bullet points here. It's a abstract semantic tree. Or syntax tree, I don't know why I have this. And those expression trees then model the code, they model what a compile method actually should contain in there. They model the logic. Uh, expression tree used to represent the implementation of certain code. So, uh, our small talk has to return those expression trees for every compile method. Instead of just returning the compile method, you return an expression tree. Or actually an expression. And so does the other people. I mean, Ruby, I mean, Python, or whatever the other dynamic languages we have, all the .NET dynamic languages. Uh, and I'll give an example here. This is a very simple example method. Let's call it sign stream, and if it's built on a number somewhere, and if it's lower than zero, it turns negative, otherwise positive. Very simple. So to return the logic of this method, we have to create this expression. And this is an example of how it might look like. It's expression, which has a condition, a true and false value. And the condition itself is some expression which compares self. And those are meta objects, those are not complete objects, those are meta objects describing code. Uh, obviously, things are not that simple because everything has to be expression, you can't have codes and concepts in there, so it's a little bit more complex. There is an expression for constant, and there's an expression for argument and everything else, and those meta objects can be compiled and, and uh, processed the way it wishes. So let's go back to the Hello World example from earlier. Uh, the show method uh, on transcript stream, one of the things it does is self next to all an object. So if we have to implement this method uh, in uh, our small talk, we have to return to the dot that DLR somehow this logic self next to all an object. And the way to do this is obviously there are two parameters. The self, self is also a parameter, and the argument. And we return an expression, a dynamic expression. This is a very good one because all message sends are dynamic calls. Those will be resolved dynamically. And we give it a binder. So we say, when, when we want to do the next good all operation, here are the arguments. And this guy can help you figure out how to do the next good all operation. Uh, so what happens is when somebody actually runs the code, uh, the code side will say, this is the first time, I need to figure out what to do, go to the binder, binder, help me do the next code operation. And this is how it works all the way around. At some end, we have the primitives, but, uh, but this is the basic logic. And this expression here obviously will create internally a code site, which calls the binder. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, this was the example from, from earlier that uh, the binder that makes me call will return the component. Uh, oh, yeah, no, this is the, the previous example where I put the component from next below. Obviously, it will be expression, so it's, the binder has to return uh, binding the rule with the expression within a dynamic receiver, and etc, etc, etc. But this is very low level stuff, so how does it work on a higher level? Well, this is what I call the code pipeline. What happens with the source code to actually get something executed and running? So we start with small code sources. Normal file, nothing special. We have a small code class, everyone knows about this. We get some small code abstraction to the tree, or ASD. Not much here. What happened is there is a thing called I call it the moment the small code JIT compiler, and it takes the, our uh, syntax tree, abstract syntax tree, and converts it into those expression uh, expression trees. Most of the time it's not one conversion because small code is very simple grammar, there's no magic here. There are a few places where we need some special game. For example, block closure requires a little bit more code. So when we have in here we have one node called block closure. 
this thing has to emit several commands, especially between nodes. We call block version with some initializations and context, and there are a few other things that have to be handled in the past. It converts to the other way. Next thing is when it has to run. Uh, I don't know how visible they are, but also slightly orange and also slightly different color. Uh, and this part here is provided by Microsoft, and the orange one is the one that I did. So what happens here is that the DR, the dynamic language runtime of the link compiler, and this is used extensively in .NET because if you uh, use the link, it uses it all the time with uh, extension set. The link compiler will take a special tree and then actually generate uh, a dynamic assembly, which is Microsoft Intermedia Language, MCR, IO, which is their, their byte code. The same thing as the C sharp compiler does, and everything else, except this is happens on, on the fly. And when this has to be executed, there's obviously the JIT compiler, uh, which is the CRL, the language and time, which will convert this to some machine code. So this is what happens. It has to go to one, two, three intermediate stages before getting executed. The good thing is, those guys here have a lot of money, so their compilers are very good and very aggressive, and their outputs this is the code and this is the performance code. And they optimize quite a lot. So even if you give here a very high level uh, thing, something like loop, because those things, there are some uh, very simple nodes, but there are also um, more complex nodes like loop, while, true, or something like this, they'll be able to uh, convert it and optimize it to some uh, efficient machine code. And the, the good part is, I don't care about this, you just give them some very abstract model on how to model the execution. So there is only one problem with this approach. Cost. It's expensive. If you have to do for this for every message sent, forget it. We won't get this in the cost. So oops. obviously the thing is don't forget what they told you about the logic. This is the involved with inline caching. Um, so to go back to the example here when you do the, the transcript show, it will go to the binder, resolve the operation. So to go to the binder, you have to do a method to help somehow to convert this compound method to expression, to some magic, return the expression, this can be an expensive operation. Then it will go here and say evaluate with arguments. So what happens if you need to re-evaluate re this thing? Well, obviously, we don't have to do the first part again. We already figure out what the logic for, for, for the show method is. We just need to send in the valid message again. And this is the good stuff. Uh, because only the second part needs to be executed again. And because we actually have an object here, that's why we have the object to start with, this object can, can save uh, the logic expression tree. Uh, and only the second part is to be re-evaluated. Only problem is, only problem is, how do we know if this is if this is okay to re-evaluate it again? Well, the, the thing to do is the binder has to tell us that for this particular logic for the method show, when is it valid? And it gives us a thing called restriction. And it says, listen, here's the logic for the show, and you can evaluate it as much as you want, as long as the object is a transcript stream. Because if you if you do a polymorphic, if you give it another receiver, an integer, and it has a method show, the logic might be different. So what the polymorphic in our cache uses is this binding rule, which has the expression of the logic and the restriction. And the restriction is very important. This is why the difference between good and bad is implementation. The restrictions are efficient. You can just check the restriction. Oh, it's still a three. Execute directly. And if you remember from some of the previous talks, when somebody showed the method that there was an instance variable called function point or something like this, in our case, the binding rule will save the information to the compiler code for the machine code. So you don't have to go through these steps again. As long as they can uh, validate the restriction and the restriction says it's okay, we just jump to the to the machine code, execute the logic, we are we are getting it. Uh, let's see what's the next slide. Yeah, uh, 
swap asset, it can reuse uh, the logic. Uh, and if the restriction fails, because with this time you gave me something else, well, back to step one, back to the binder and say, okay, now I have an integer, what do I do? The binder has to figure out uh, what to do. So restrictions are very important. Uh, and restrictions can be more complex. Uh, they can be instance specific. They can say, for thi this, this code is valid only for this specific code instance of an object. Because if an object itself returns some instance specific logic for this, <laughs> Uh, for this method, obviously the restriction is also it's a specific. Uh, the restriction is a dominant polymorphism of an object. If you know that the method is implemented an object and only an object and nowhere else, you don't have to check. Because now this is the only implementation of tools that in the system and there's no restriction. You can always run the method directly. Uh, and there can be some more exotic restrictions. And I have some examples later. Restrictions are about the key pull off in inline cache. This is what makes most of them fast. Without this, you can cache the implementation. Without caching, you have to do this work every single time to send the message. Um, so, obviously, the .NET DLR has a cache. It's called the pull off in inline cache. Every call site has this cache. So, it has three levels of cache. Obviously, it's .NET, so we start with zero. <laughs> um, level zero remembers the last call. Because we know if, if we got an integer there, chances the next time it will be an integer is very fast. So this is the number one. And next time it just checks the rule. If it's okay, they're running. If not, it sees if there is a, a good chance that there's something in level one. Level one has the last 10 uh, binding rules, which means the, the logic, the, ex the expression, and the restriction for it. And level two has 100 rules, and those are shared across all sides. So if a call site, uh, if you have a call site next to all here, and you have another method that does next to all, the chances are that those two next to all who went to the same method at the end are very high. So we can catch this across them. So that's why it's called for similar sites. And this is something to compile to figure out if, if there's a chance that it will be the same method or not. Smaller chances are very high because we have to compare uh, Select. We don't have scope and other exotic stuff. Uh, so back to the previous picture, the .NET DLR. Uh, so this is what the big picture is. They provide you this new stuff. Expression trees is the thing that modeled the logic. Call size is the way we run it, is to make it run fast. The dynamic object interlock is some tools to interact with other objects. Every language provides their own binder because we are the only one that knows how to do next to all. And Ruby has its own binder, Python has, JavaScript has, they have some uh, .NET stuff, and a com binder because we'd like to communicate with the com world. Previously, .NET was quite difficult and they figured this out. We'd like to communicate with the com world the same way it does uh, in the guidelines. And we have the languages on top, and because they have on this, they can communicate however they want. So just a, sh a small thing about types. Um, do we need common vocabulary when we talk to each other? Obviously we do, because just being able to send messages doesn't mean that you can communicate. You need to be able to understand the same words. Uh, that's non-defined. The, the thing they have is non-defined uh, common vocabulary, common vocabulary types. But de facto, try to reuse the .NET class library. In other words, try to see if you can map as many things from the standard of that to small talks classes. So they have a system char, map it to character. They have system string, try to map it to string. It doesn't go well, but it can be done. Only problem is this one is immutable. So we can map it to immutable string in small talks. <coughs> and it's okay in most of the cases. Because small talks, according to the XPJ20 implementation, only three literals are immutable. So that's okay. And of course, let's do a little demo. Because we want some fun. Um, and if it goes to the other monitor. This wouldn't be the idea if you have .NET small talk if you can run in silver light in the browser. So this is what we do here. We are actually running small talk uh, inside the browser, inside Silverlight. There's nothing, no services, nothing special. 
special on the program so I have to turn it off. And it integrates with the silver light uh, seamless and transparently. This thing, silver light makes it a bubble uh, variable. And what it is what is actually a .NET object, it's silver lights demo dot main page. If you want I can show the stitch up but if you ask it for the class it says it's uh, this is the .NET object for the class and it's uh, the instance of this object is main page class obviously and I can ask it for the print thing and other stuff but I can also ask it to go to stuff because message sending is the most important thing and I can stay to it still page show balloon and this show balloon method is actually implemented in .NET. This is not small dot method. But small dot doesn't, no, doesn't care actually to implement the show balloon. It just sends a message and the object has to figure out what the logic of this is. And it shows the balloon. I can position the balloon, I can do other stuff. Hide the balloon. More interesting is, I don't know if it's visible from the back or not, so I can uh, zoom in. More well, interesting is, I want, I want them to talk to me as well, because I have a, some very nice object which I want to, them to use. And in this case, I have my silver light page. It has a method called runtimer, which takes two parameters. It takes an integer with a millisecond power, which is another timer, and it takes a callback function. So every time the timer ticks, it will call this function. Obviously, small talk, we don't have compact functions. What do we do? We have blocks. So we give the block. And the net code will run its timer, and every time it ticks, we'll run the block. Let's see if it works. Hopefully. Yes, it does. So now it's the net code is actually driving the timer, and it's calling it back into small talk, into the block. And the block is first class of that object. It doesn't care. It's transparent. Um, we can do another small demo here, uh, if I can find my mouse. This is very primitive. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but... <laughs> I'll show you that one later. But basically, we have a Ruby object. Application or 
uh, command line application. So inside a process, you can have several Smalltalk runtime, and Smalltalk runtime is analogous to a Smalltalk image. So we instantiate a new image inside the process. Those, those can talk across each other, uh, but they have their own set of classes. And this is this is required if you want to do uh, web application hosting. Everything that has to do with cloud, big companies are interested to save money, and they don't want they want to have multi-tenant um, customers, etc. running their own code, but inside the same web service process or whatever it is. Um, some specifics, CBOs, yes we have them, they are, uh, they are CBOs as they are, it's one of, but they are actually not that, that necessary, it turns out. Because while the CBOs implemented, we have quick uh, and then check. But since the whole thing is remotely to cache, okay, the method will have to start with a little bit more expensive on strings, that's not the end of the world. Once we've done this, we've already cached it. Uh, strings, there are two types, they are immutable and, and normal string. Uh, and if you get a string from either side, if you get a string from .NET, it will be immutable strings, so you can't change the strings. There's no small processes because, uh, well, that, that is known, but you have threads. Send is a little bit tricky because uh, it's currently not implemented, but it's not part of the, the ANSI standard. And especially if you are being called from the outside world, from uh, from a Ruby object to somebody else who's the sender, it's a difficult thing. Response to is a little bit tricky because you can't just go and ask the class to respond to this method. You have to actually ask every particular object because Ruby objects and other objects that are, uh, that are based on prototyping they have instance specific behavior. And one thing I haven't implemented yet is events. Uh, we have problems with object space. There's no object space reflection, which means you can't do all instances or reflection or references. You can't do become because there's no way to traverse our objects in space. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to become other people's objects. Or if you're a Ruby, you don't want small becoming become your object something else. Uh, so, but what we can do is behave like, which means that we cannot change the identity of the object, but we might want all objects to become small Tell this to the Ruby people. I, I agree with you, but we have to convince people. But what we can do is behave like, which means that we can change their behavior. Because we are responsible for the behavior. And of course, the debugger has inspection capabilities. It's difficult to use because it's the low level debugger, but you can traverse the, the object space if it's necessary. I want to find this. Uh, what are the threats? The threats are the major tech companies. Microsoft, unfortunately, is very true. They can one day decide this is a very good thing, another day probably thinks that they really but this is true for all companies. I like that book, by the way. <laughs> um, what are the good news? We are Unicode, but this is fully Unicode, uh, it's fully multi-threaded, it has large class library, not a small one, but the uh, less. It's web cost of also travel. It's released under an MIT license, so this can be used uh, for everything. In the near future, I'd like to implement generics. Last library in Falcon, I haven't decided whether this should happen automatically or should generate method wrappers so you can browse them. And obviously, finish version 1.0 and write tests. I'm not very good at testing. And the future, GUI integration with GUI forms. Our subsystem is two times. If people know what subsystem is, this is a um, way to implement namespaces not only in objects but also on method level. And this should be very difficult to implement once you have uh, the whole logic running. Uh, Mixins and instance specific behavior because we want to handle stuff. But especially the things like I want to trace all uh, instance variable assignment only this particular object because we have three database connections, well, two of them are working, one of them is not working. I want to trace on this particular database connection. So instance specific behavior will help. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure I have understood how you were able to type C options when you are passing out options. Sorry, how much? Uh, I, I, I do not understand how you type options. How I type? Do, do you, because uh, as far as I know, Tiara is a uh, Yes, 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 yes. Um, that's true because they have in the new one, the uh, Ruby Smart Demo, which comes up. 
in in uh, in version four, they, they, are, they have a type called dynamic. So you declare a variable as a dynamic, and it, when you press dot, it will say, "Oh, this is dynamic. I cannot give you permission for this." Okay, I'm used to this in Smalltalk. And then you write this. And what they will do, what their compiler will do, will create a code size and all the objects and, and a binder, and they'll call our objects from time and time and say, "Okay, how do I do this?" Who does work with the first class classes? Who what? Who does that work with the first class classes? Is it fully working or there are some restrictions or? Uh, almost fully working. There are no restrictions with first class classes. No, no, no. Uh, the thing is, here you go. Um, you have dynamic objects and you just, I don't know how busy the it is, but you can just ask it for its name and say hello. Have you defined a source code for a source code format? You know, we saw a couple. Uh, no, I took the the x 2 j method standard, the X standard format. Okay. So have you, you you showed us a code snippet before, but you also know. Sure. Um, I'll just send this one to the slide and find it. I'll just show you a small method here. I don't know if it's visible. It's the final format, and the x 2 j standard has a uh, well-defined uh, format in there, and this is the one I use. I didn't want to invent anything new. I just took the, the standard and keep the standard as much as possible. And it work? Yeah. yeah. If you have uh, some method in .NET, and one of the arguments has type, you can pass a small type object, if, if the small object is convertible to that type, yes. But, but the thing is, we try not to implement small object. We try to map the object as much as possible. So if they give us a string, we try to use it directly. If they give us a log, which is not an object, we can speak to the log and we just uh, let us if this was an object. Now how did you implement the collection classes? They are still not implemented, but the thing is to wrap the .NET classes. Obviously, it's a cool thing that you've done, but I just wonder if you aim to run any specific small talk libraries, say Seaside or something like that. No, the, the, the standard, the x 3 j 20 standard, has a very thin library for interoperability between small It was done in 98, and basically what they did is they took the big vendors and they tried to agree, and they only agreed on comments the lowest subset of the stuff. Um, the idea is to use as much of the .NET library as possible and I don't think it is, I don't want to do a new small talk diet. What I want to give people the opportunity is if they have a big .NET project or a small talk project and they want to move some of the code around and some logic is very difficult to migrate to .NET, I want to give them the opportunity to keep that logic into small talk and write the rest of that. Because one of the things that we are weak at is user interface or browsing and stuff. Let Microsoft do the super light and let them do the new Windows presentation convention and everything and let us write the business logic. Um, at the moment, no. I, because I'm not an expert in uh, some of the other small talks, uh, this is something to be determined in the future. Those parts to see if it's possible for us. I think that's a good way to close. Thank you.